So we are so excited to be speaking with Martin Edwards today, uh, who is one of those people who has so many fingers and so many pies, so to speak. Uh, it makes us wonder how he finds time for, say, sleeping and eating. Uh, in addition to being one of England's leading solicitors in the area of employment law, uh, he's widely recognized as an authority on crime fiction, having written a much lauded study on the topic that we've referenced many, many times on our podcast. That would be The Golden Age of Murder, which is an encyclopedic and extremely entertaining, I should add, um, look at the authors of The Golden Age of Detective Fiction. What we on this podcast might call Christy et al., though I'm quite certain he would not call it that. <laughs> Uh, he is also a celebrated mystery writer in his own right, having published, by my count, I believe nearly two dozen novels over the past three decades. Um, and I'm not done, because he is also the current president of the Detection Club. And last year, in 2020, he was awarded the Crime Writers Association's Diamond Dagger, which sounds very dangerous. Um, and that apparently is the, the highest honor in British crime writing in recognition of the uh, sustained excellence of his work in the genre. So, Martin, uh, welcome and congratulations. Well, thanks, Kemper, and it's, it's great to be with you and uh, talking uh, uh, virtually about Agatha and uh, detective fiction. Yes. We're very excited to have you, and um, I'm a little bit jealous of how prolific you are. It's uh, quite the accomplishment. <laughs> Well, thank, thanks, Catherine, but uh, uh, quite a lot of books, but written over a very long period of time. It's been a lifelong uh, uh, enthusiasm of mine, I must say. So I'm curious, how did you become interested in mysteries? I mean, what was your way in? I assume you were an avid mystery reader when, when you were younger, but I'm, I'm just curious how you developed the passion that you have. Yes, yes. Well, uh, it, it is quite literally a lifelong passion and it, uh, it it goes back to the age of eight and it goes back specifically to Agatha Christie. Uh, Agatha Christie was, was, was the key influence and what happened uh, uh, was that uh, at that uh, tender age I, I was taken to a village fete in, in Cheshire, the county where, where I grew up, where I still live in the northwest of England, uh, but it was a fate organized by an American who'd come to live in Cheshire, and, and therefore it's done on the grand scale. And he was somebody who'd worked in Hollywood, he was a very senior person with MGM, and he arranged that the village fate should have the world film premiere of a film called Murder Most Foul, starring Margaret Rutherford as Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. Uh, albeit a film based on a book in which Miss Marple does not appear, of course. But um, uh, for a small child, this was an extraordinary uh, uh, occasion. I, I remember it vividly uh, to this day. Uh, a beautiful, sunny uh, afternoon. It was the 4th of July, as a matter of fact, uh, that year. And uh, Margaret Rutherford, uh, um, I remember vividly, um, landing in a helicopter from uh, uh, sort of coming down. Uh, quite extraordinary sight, uh, uh, landing in a cleared space in the grounds of this country house where the uh, fate was being held and she declared the fate open. And then the, uh, all the assembled uh, uh, visitors and there were thousands of people it was a huge event, it got into the national press. It was a huge event uh, in those days. Uh, we eventually got in to see the film and I loved it. And um, I went home that night with my, my sort of brain buzzing with the excitement of the, the story, you know, the, the clues, the mystery, the amateur detective, the red herrings, the uh, unexpected solution. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and so uh, my grandmother was, was alive in those days. She was living with us. She had a few Agatha Christie paperbacks. And I picked one off the shelf called Murder at the Vicarage because that did have Miss Marple in the story. I started reading. And from that moment, I was hooked. I was hooked in two ways. Firstly, as a reader and as a lover of detective fiction, first and foremost, Agatha Christie. And secondly, it was something I wanted to do myself. I wanted to emulate uh, Agatha in some small way and write detective stories that entertained other people the way that hers entertained me. So, so it all does stem from Agatha. That's, I, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better, I think, uh, origin story. 
I mean, <laughs> also Margaret Rutherford kind of making a yeah. James Bond entrance. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's incredible. You could not make it up. It was uh, astonishing. People in that village still, uh, people still remember it. I, I, I gave a talk in London uh, three or four years ago uh, to the Oxford Union Society in London and um, somebody in the audience came from my hometown and she had been there too it turned out she still remembered she still remembered that occasion it was it was utterly memorable it's it's so great because i mean the the village fate is also such a yeah. obviously yeah. such a twisty trope and you know yeah. dead man's folly and we That's should let you know by the way we we cover all of christie's works in chronological order um, by publication date, and we've just uh, finished covering The Pale Horse. So we're quite oh, right. far along, but yes. we still do have a couple to go. So it wasn't too in, in the, uh, you know, it was in the fairly recent past that we covered Dead Man's Folly and the, uh, yeah. the Village Fate. I also love the idea that it was a fate organized by an American. So even though it's yeah. a traditional <laughs> British thing, it was totally overdone. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was out of this world, a, a, an unrepeatable one-off. <laughs> but uh, it was a huge thing in my life, really. It's uh, had a great influence, great impact. I also well, I, love that the first book was Murder at the Vicarage. We we love Murder at the Vicarage. Just yeah. like adore Murder at the Vicarage. Um, the voice in it is so kind of compelling, and I mm. I think um, especially especially the child reading it. Like I yeah. still distinctly remembered. I read it probably when I was like nine years old or something, and we reread it for the podcast you know every single detail of it just pops back you know yeah. and one of her sort of I think as an entry point I know that we always have this conversation and I don't know what you would recommend ultimately Martin and we'll make you answer that probably but people always ask like what a good entry point is and usually like we're inclined to say something like death on the Nile but I often wonder if it's a younger reader. It's not that murder at the Vicarage is not actually gruesome, it is. But um, if that's not actually like a very compelling entry point into Christie. Yeah, well, well, it certainly worked for me, that's for sure. So, uh, so I, I would certainly recommend it unhesitatingly. I, I loved it and I loved the, the, the idea of the twist and being surprised. I, I still enjoy that, that sensation when, when I experience it. And, uh, and I got that sensation repeatedly from those early books. Even a book like The Seven Dials Mystery, which is not Agatha's greatest book by a long short, the, the double twist at the end really, I, I remember quite vividly the experience of uh, being bowled over by it. Uh, you know, so uh, so it, it, did, it did make a, a tremendous impression on me at just the age when when you're starting to uh, think more for yourself and it it, uh, it it resonated through the years yeah no I I, I agree with that I think that um, the uh, the the murder at the vicarage you know we have that currently in our our top 10 is number 10 actually and we're, we're I think determined to keep it in the top 10 uh, when we're done because we're also ranking all these novels as right, well. so, right, right, which is right. just a, a ridiculous yet <laughs> uh, uh, fun endeavor as well you know yeah. ridiculous and enjoyable in equal measure but um yeah we're we're huge fans of that title and also i love that you gave a shout out to seven dials because we've ranked it quite low but there are many people who have a lot of affection for it for that specific reason because it really is a very clever and unexpected yeah. twist at the end of that so yeah. i think it probably is one of the better of the of the thriller titles for that yeah i i would agree i would agree but i should say before we because we could obviously talk with you about christy and christy alone for probably three hours um you know our podcast is obviously more or less focused on christy exclusively but the two of us are of course interested in other writers we know you're very much inter interested in, in other uh, uh detective fiction and crime fiction writers and um I would say, you know, what's so fascinating about the story that you tell in the golden age of murder is how, you know, Christie and a number of other prominent mystery authors of her day banded mm. together to form yeah. the Detection Club. And, yeah. uh, you know, we probably have a number of listeners who aren't actually familiar with the Detection Club. So as, you know, one of the preeminent sort of researchers into the old Detection Club and as the current leader of, you know, the contemporary Detection Club, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of what that is. Well, it, it's really the the oldest social network uh, for crime writers anywhere in the world, and it came into being uh, 
1930, the, the year of murder at the vicarage, uh, and really at a time when crime writers by and large didn't know each other. And uh, what had happened a couple of years earlier was that Anthony Barclay Cox, who, who wrote as Anthony Barclay and as Francis Isles, he had the idea of inviting a few uh, leading uh, detective novelists around for dinner. And that was a success. So there were more dinners uh, and more people invited. And uh, before long, he was a great ideas man, uh, Anthony Barclay. And he had the idea of forming them into a club, but uh, not a club that just anybody could join. It, uh, there was a, a, a kind of secret uh, ballot uh, selection process. The idea was that the writers had to be of a certain standard. They were very keen on their uh, standards, although uh, as always with these things, they're applied in a slightly uh, maverick kind of way in practice. But uh, uh, Agatha Christie was one of the founder members, Dorothy L. Sayers, A. A. Milne, uh, who'd written The Red House Mystery before he went on to Winnie the Pooh uh, and Fame and Fortune, uh, uh, Ronald Knox, H. C. Bailey, Freeman Wills Cross, and the first president was uh, G. K. Chesterton. They'd, they'd invited Conan Doyle, but he, he was uh, uh, very frail. It was a few months before he died, so he couldn't accept, but Chesterton did accept. And so they formed this club, and it was at a time, as I've discussed in the Golden Age of Murder, when certainly Barclay and Sayers and Christie had all, all had, in the recent past, pretty traumatic experiences in their personal lives. And I think that, uh, to some extent, for them, the detection club was a refuge. It was a place where they could uh, uh, meet like-minded folk, people who understood the ups and downs of being a writer. I think that's that's... An enduring feature of the detection club as, as it is today of the crime rights association mystery rights of america and so on uh, this sharing of experience crying on each other's shoulder uh, where appropriate so uh, so the the club was formed and it and it quickly uh became quite important in the world of detective fiction and they they wrote collaborative stories that were broadcast on the bbc and then uh, uh, the year after the formation in 1931, they wrote um, a collaborative novel. This is, uh, this is it, the, the Floating Admiral. Uh, that's the, the first edition. It's still in print. Uh, and that was uh, a book uh, which had 13 members contributing. Agatha Christie was one of them. She, she wrote an early chapter, a very good early chapter. Chesterton wrote a prologue. Sayers, Sayers wrote a chapter, Freem Wills Crofts. Anthony Barclay had the terrible duty of writing the concluding chapter because they'd not planned the story. So, so he wrote a very long chapter at the end trying to pull it all together. Uh, and they call the chapter Clearing Up the Mess, uh, which probably tells you how he felt about it. But, um, but it, it was a fun book and it, it was actually a pretty good story. It hangs together. Uh, fairly well. It's very entertainingly written, seeing all these different styles, one person taking over from another, without much in the way of uh, organisation at all. They all had to write their idea of what the solution would be, and that was included at the end. That's, that's quite an entertaining and informative read in itself. So The Floating Admiral was really a, a landmark book, and it was the first of quite a number of, uh, of publications that the Detection Club has been responsible for over the years. The most recent one is a book called How Done It, which is uh, a book that celebrated the 90th birthday of the club last year. It's a book about the art and craft of mystery writing with 90 contributions edited by myself. But there's a piece by Christie about uh, about plotting of course and and pieces by Sayers and Chesterton as well as many of the luminaries of today like John Le Carre, Len Dayton, Ian Rankin, uh, Sophie Hanna uh, and uh, Val McDermott, Anne Cleves and, and many more. So the Detection Club has has continued to exist and it's continued to have this very collegiate ethos. It remains a small club, uh, currently only about 60 members 
uh, but this this idea of mutual support has remained very important uh, to the present members as, as it was in the past. And so all the members and all the estates of the deceased members contributed to how done it without, without charge to help to keep the club afloat uh, financially. It uh, just shows you the, the enthusiasm that people still have for it. And it all goes back to Christie and the others back in 1930. We should encourage people to, I was actually going to ask you very specifically about How Done It, which is such a recent publication, I, I myself actually have not read it yet. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm certainly going to be buying it. And I think we should encourage people to check that out, especially because I was very interested to see that it does have a piece by Christie. And I'm, I'm just curious about what, as to what that piece is. Is that a, um, an essay that she had written somewhere else it's, at some point? Or? It's, a, it's a, an, an extract from something that she'd written previously. Gotcha. And what, what, I did with the book, the way it turned out anyway, is it, event, it, it eventually it became a huge book. Uh, I've, I've got a copy on the shelf. I, uh, pull it down. It's, uh, it's a huge book now, but, um, wow. but it was originally meant to be quite a small book. Uh, I thought maybe about 20 people uh, uh, contributing, but in the end there were 90. And so the, I, as it grew and grew, I, my thinking about it changed. And so I, I, I thought that the essays of the past, I would take elements that still seem to me to be relevant to people uh, today, whether they're fans or whether they're interested in the craft of writing. And it was a question of trying to knit these things together to, to make something that was uh, a coherent whole. Uh, so that, that was quite an interesting exercise in itself, as you can imagine, with so many new original essays but grafting in these pieces from the past as well and so that that was an unusual thing to do but but actually very very rewarding as a as a, an exercise and as an insight into the way that different writers feel about the writing process i can't i i love a big you know hunk of a book like that so i'm i'm excited to to get my hands on that <laughs> Um, the original premise of like I'm trying to think of the writers association like how the detection club was formed and it seems to me that it has a little bit of a basis in other sort of writers groups and art groups that came before it and I was thinking about that in regards to the floating admiral in particular because obviously what the floating admiral is actually doing is playing a sort of version of exquisite corpse and that obviously was something that was extremely popular with, for example, the Surrealists. Yes, yes. So that was clearly another kind of working group in a lot of ways, yeah. right? And, you know, it's a parlor game in some ways, but yeah. also a massive artistic endeavor. And so Exquisite Corpse obviously is drawing um, or painting, but it seems to me that that would have come right before then. And I just wondered yeah. a little bit if there was any sort of, if you knew from research or anything else, where they were drawing some of their influences in. Because also it seems to me a little bit like it has some reference in probably like university clubs, right, too, that that's also where mm. that kind of working mm. group is coming from. Mm. And I just didn't know if you knew of sort of any of the inspirational background. I, that. My personal take on it, which, which is no more than an informed guess, if I'm honest, is that you, I, I think you, you do always ha have situations where ideas are in the ether, they're in the air, and so people come sometimes quite separately to similar conclusions. It's, it's very interesting that you mention Exquisite Corpse because when, when I wrote uh, a book called Gallows Court a couple of years ago, which was a, a kind of homage to golden age fiction, set in 1930 for very deliberate reasons, um, I actually talk about Exquisite Corpse, not because um, I relate it directly to Christian members of the Detection Club, but because I do agree with, with the point you're making, Catherine, that it, it's one of those ideas that's in the atmosphere of the times. And so it seemed to me to fit into a book, albeit written in the 21st century, that, that seeks to uh, play with 
uh, the atmosphere of the times and what was going on in, in those days. So, so I, I think that the, these influences are often indirect. They may be there subconsciously, or it may be that people come to similar conclusions independently. But, but when, when you stand back many years later, you, you see these things developing along similar lines at, uh, uh, within one particular era. That's, that's the way I see it. That makes sense. Um, I was interested, we covered actually the Floating Admiral in um, a, a Patreon episode, which is sort of a, a bonus stream of content that we do on the side. And it was great fun to cover it. And, and I have to say, um, one of my takeaways from it, and, and this dovetails sort of nicely into my next question for you, but one of my takeaways from it is that that last chapter, I mean, Anthony Barkley was really doing the heavy lifting for that, yeah. <laughs> for that book. And I was struck by um, how funny he, he is mm. actually in, you know, the book even ends in this, it's sort of delightfully jocular way. And it really, it's, it's sort of the opposite of leaving a bad taste in your mouth because the book yeah. gets a little down, you know, and stuck in the muck of multiple people trying to write a mystery somewhere yeah. two thirds of the way in. And he really lifts it out of the muck. And by the end you're like, oh, delightful. Um, and my, my takeaway from that, because I haven't read as much Anthony Barkley, I actually, after, you know, subsequent to that, did read The Poison Chocolates Case. Uh, I'm going to ask you about that as well. But um, my takeaway was, oh, you know, if I like Agatha Christie and I like, you know, the lightness that she often brings to the genre, um, Anthony Barkley might actually be someone who's perhaps doing something a little similar. And if mm -hmm. I like Christie, maybe I'll like Barkley. And, yeah. you know, I'm curious if... Um, you have almost like recommendations for readers who are focused very, very much on Christy as we are, because Christy obviously is the one, she's the go-to, right? She's the one yes. that's, that's yeah. the most widely published. So you don't have yeah. to look for her. She's in every bookstore yeah. and every library, but who are the writers, um, honestly, either of the golden age or even later who are doing christy -ish things who, you know, a, a Christie reader or a Christie fan may particularly enjoy? How can we broaden our horizons, I suppose, is my question as Christie. Yes, yeah, so and, and it's a good question, I, I think, uh, Kemper. And I, I don't think there's any doubt that, that Christie was a huge fan of Anthony Barclay. I think for proof of that, if, if we look at John Curran's uh, wonderful book about the secret notebooks. Um, she, she writes uh, at, at one point in, in her exercise books about the detection club. She was thinking of, of a novel set, set in, in the detection club. And she writes down the names of, of various members and next to Anthony Barclay, she puts fantastic writer. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what she thought about Anthony Barclay. And when she wrote about it, she, she makes passing reference to him from time to time, and she was clearly a big fan. And uh, I, I think they they had a shared uh, enthusiasm for P.G. Woodhouse, which I think was reciprocated. Um, and I think you're absolutely right about the, the wit of Barclay. He was a very witty writer. You see it in, in a number of books. He was very uh, ironic. He was also very cynical at times, perhaps excessively so. But I, I think this gift for ingenuity is uh, is something that Christie was very impressed by. I think that she, I'm guessing now, but I, I think she probably saw him as more of a soulmate than, than perhaps any other uh, detective novelist of the time. He was doing the sort of things in some of his books that she was trying to do because he was a great innovator and experimenter. And of course, Agatha was as well, it's often overlooked that she's a very innovative writer, uh, not in every book, but, but, but in quite a lot of books. She experiments, she innovates, she takes things uh, to a fresh level. And Barclay, in, in different ways, was doing the same thing at roughly the same time, not for as many years. He, he had a relatively brief career. But, but I, I think that there was a great affinity between the two of them. I think if you like Agatha Christie, uh, there's a very good chance that you'll be interested in in Barclay's uh, books as, as well. In terms of other writers, she she was very friendly with Dorothy L. Sayers. She particularly liked the early Sayers books rather than the later ones uh, with uh, with Harry Vane. I think she describes 
whimsy at one point as a good man spoiled in, in later books. Uh, not, not a view that, that I would necessarily agree with, I must say, but, but I think she preferred the, the early books. In terms of later writers, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that um, if you like Christie, you'll be interested in Edmund Crispin. He was, uh, he was a, a great admirer of Christie. They, they knew each other through the Detection Club. John Dixon Carr, one of the uh, uh, minority of Detection Club members who was American, he was very friendly with Christie. Uh, he's referenced in uh, one or two of the books. Uh, and I, I think that she, she got on with him personally. I think she enjoyed his books enormously. And I think that although, of course, he was the great specialist in the locked room mystery. Uh, uh, I think that uh, she certainly enjoyed those books. And there's, there's a lot of John Dixon Carr that will appeal to the Christie fans. Um, she, she makes a sort of oblique reference in, in uh, uh, the clocks to Freeman Wills Crofts, the alibi type of mystery. Cyril Quain, I think, is the the character uh, uh, named in the book. But, but I, I think she probably enjoyed those, but to perhaps uh, a lesser extent, because there wasn't quite the same sense of fun that you get with Anthony Barclay and with Edmund Crispin and with Christiana Brand, another Detection Club member uh, from the late forties onwards. So, so I, I think with, with Christy, uh, she, she, she had a sense of humour uh, uh, that comes over, I, I believe, in, in a lot of the novels. And I think she liked wit in uh, crime fiction. She liked the light-hearted touch, e even in, in the uh, books that dealt with such a serious subject as murder. So I, I, I think it's that element of humour that appeals to her. And if, if you like that element in, in Christie, then, then I think certainly with the likes of Barclay, Edmund Crispin, Christiana Brand, uh, you won't go that far wrong because they could all plot as well. John Dixon Carr as well. Uh, you get very strong plots by and large in those books too. So, so there's a lot to, uh, to enjoy. I have not read <laughs> Christiana Brand, so I'm going to have to, to, to pick some up, but it's funny, um, Catherine has heard me uh, go on and on about Edmund Crispin for years now. I'm, just Gervais Fenn is, you know, after all of Christie's creations, probably my favorite detective mm. of the golden age. And before we started doing the podcast, when people would ask uh, for a, a recommendation beyond Christie, I would always say, read The Moving Toy Shop because it's Agatha Christie meets P.G. Woodhouse. Now yeah. that I'm a much closer reader of Christie, though, what I realize is that Christie herself has many Woodhousean elements, you know, in yeah. her novel. She, of course, has that lightness of touch herself. So I don't think I would describe it exactly that way, but I totally agree with you. I think they have that same uh, lightness of touch and wit. Yeah. And wit is the yes. best, best way. Yes, yes, and joie, joie de vivre. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's delightful. Um, fantastic. Yeah. What's a normal detection club meeting like? <laughs> well, um, uh, in, in normal times, uh, which of course we're not living in right now, but in, in normal times there are three meetings a year. Uh, there are two meetings currently, uh, and they're, they're dinners essentially, it's a social social get together, that, that's, that's its raison d'etre and always has been. Uh, so, so there are uh, a couple of dinners at the Garrett Club, uh, uh, there are members of the Detection Club who are members of the Garrett Club, so we get to, uh, to go there, which is, which is very, very agreeable indeed. And then there's the main annual dinner, uh, which is when uh, new members uh, are, are inducted, so to speak. Uh, and that takes place at, uh, at a variety of different venues. For the last few years, it's been at the Ritz Hotel. Before that, it was at the, uh, the Dorchester Hotel. Before that, at the... Uh, Middle Temple, and it's been at the Cafe Royal Savoy Hotel. So it's a, so it's a grand kind of uh, event. But but they are essentially social events. We we have in recent years started doing something a bit different. The Detection Club and the Crime Rights Association are both involved with uh, Gladstone's Library, which is in North Wales, but but not too far from where I am in Cheshire now. And uh, that's a wonderful atmospheric uh, historic library. Where, where you can stay in the library, there are rooms, and we have a weekend, which is... Oh, my heart. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic place. Uh, uh, I, I absolutely love it. And, uh, and so there are talks from members of the Detection Club uh, uh, over the weekend. And the people who come along uh, get to mingle with the, the writers. And it's, it's a very enjoyable experience. Sadly, it didn't happen last year for obvious reasons. Uh, whether it will happen this year, I'm, I'm by no means confident. But, but it will come back in due course, and that's called Alibis in the Archive. And one of the things I've been trying to do as president, I became president in 2015, and I'm, I'm the eighth president over the 90 years. Um, what I've been trying to do is to try to make sure that members, first and foremost, enjoy and feel energized about the club. So that, that's part of the reason for doing the books holding the events because it has to have a reason to exist because of course nowadays in social media the the original reasons for the detection club coming into being are not quite as compelling as as they were back in 1930 so it, it has to have a reason to exist and and i think that for me the the great test was when uh, i was putting how done it together i found that pretty much every living member of the club wanted to contribute. And not, not for the money, because there wasn't any, but, but to support the club. And that was really rather wonderful. And the, the same with the estates of the deceased writers, the 20-odd uh, former members who contributed to the book. And it was that degree of enthusiasm and support from the great writers of today uh, that really uh, made me think, yes, the Detection Club still has a reason for being. And that's, uh, that's, that's very gratifying and it's, uh, it's quite humbling. Uh, and it, it's, um, it's, it's also exciting because, um, you know, I hope it will go on for many more years to come. Well, I suppose, uh, well, certainly we do as well. But I think that one of the things that is kind of lovely, you know, you said that it doesn't have the same, you know, plays on depth in the social media age, but at the same time, maybe it has a more important role because there is such this sort of digital divide between people that actually having something that's analog in a bunch of ways, I think is grounding. And especially when you're talking about something like crime, which obviously has very real world implications and books for the most part, no matter how many we've been reading on e-readers, especially during the yeah. pandemic, yeah. still I personally am like a book hoarder and um, normally my background, and it would have been my background if I'd set it up earlier, normally my background is just like stacks of books. Um, but, you know, I think that there's something lovely about the idea of actually having, um, you know, face-to-face -face interaction, interactions in an archive, actually discussions with people in person. And I suspect yeah. that when we come through this pandemic, um, I think that there will be even more cause for that, don't you think? I think you're absolutely right about that. I think if, if, if we've learned one thing above all else is that we, we are social beings, we crave this, this interaction. And although the, uh, thankfully the virtual uh, opportunities uh, uh, are, are much greater than they used to be in the past, and that has kept us going. I, I think an awful lot of people, and certainly a lot of writers, uh, are desperate to get to get back together in in person. I, I, I know that to be the case, and uh, I, I think that, that what you uh, forecast will will be proved to be absolutely right. Myself, and uh, I'm, I'm I am very optimistic indeed about the future for the Detection Club, even though it remains a small. Uh, a tiny little, tiny little thing, but uh, uh, it, it's got a great heritage, and that's something uh, to cherish, I think, and something to celebrate, and and something to to keep going. Which is the reason why I'm I'm very keen on the archives. I was asked a few years ago to become the archivist um, by Simon Brett, who was the previous president, and the archives are now held at this place, Gladstone's Library, uh, and that's something that's developing it's developing very slowly of course but uh, it's something i think is quite important to to preserve what we can the memories of the club uh for for future uh readers and enthusiasts to uh 
uh, to investigate. In future members, I mean, there has to be some element, right, that you're, you're constantly learning from other people. And I guess yeah. that's also probably part of the point of the dinners. The social yeah. aspect is allowing you to engage with people who are practicing the same craft as you, right? Well, well that, that's right. And one of the things that has really struck me in recent times um, is, is the global nature now of the interest in in the golden age, of course, in Christie, but 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 in the heritage of crime fiction, I, I went to a festival in Shanghai uh, eighteen months ago, and uh, there were thousands of people there. Uh, but I, I doubt if I met anybody over the age of thirty-five. It's a young, uh, a young audience, and and great enthusiasts, and and they had an exhibition of, of rare books, first editions of early Christie's, uh, inscribed books by John Dixon Carr. It was absolutely astonishing. And, and so in, in the Far East, in Japan as well, there's a lot of career, uh, there's a lot of interest. It, it's, uh, I, I, I went to a festival in Iceland and discovered that the Prime Minister of Iceland is a great golden age crime fiction fan. Uh, so, so these things give me uh, give me great hope uh, that uh, that the what I often thought as I was growing up uh, was was a uh, a niche interest or something I, only I was interested in is actually a a very widespread interest. It's shared by people from all kinds of different backgrounds. So, and I do find that uh, quite exciting. We've we've also found that I mean we're. Um, constantly amazed at just the 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 breadth of um, people who reach out to us who have listened to the podcast just all over the world yeah. from yeah. walks of life and um, you know it feels I mean we're we're obviously biased but it feels like Christie is just ne just becomes more and more popular every year and yeah. yes and and just I think uh, crime fiction in general and sp perhaps even specifically golden age crime fiction is there's, there's just a, a real um, you know, almost fervor for it um, among people yeah. we, we obviously love as well. Um, I wanted to ask you because we we also, of course, checked out. You did an interview recently on a uh, sister podcast of ours, which we're big fans of. She Done It. We actually just yeah. did an interview on She Done It recently as well. Shout out to Caroline, uh, Caroline Crampton, who who runs that podcast. It's fantastic. And um, it you, uh, you actually mentioned how um, after World War II, you know, the very specifically puzzle-based mysteries that were all the rage in that interwar period, which is definitely mm. what we still think of, I think, when we're talking about classic golden age detective fiction. Yeah. How those puzzle-based mysteries kind of went out of fashion after that. They fizzled in popularity, and many of that generation of writers just either stopped writing or, or fell out of favor. Of course, though, Christie is an exception to that. Yeah. And it wasn't really the focus of that conversation, but I, I wanted to ask you why <laughs> you think that Christie is such an exception. And I don't want to say that, you know, um, to the exclusion of other writers. There are plenty of other uh, Golden Age writers who are in print, and as you're saying, who are being rediscovered every day. Hmm. But I think hmm. it's a pretty inescapable fact that Christie, for whatever reason, rose, you know, above all of those contemporaries, say, in 1930, who started in, in the yes. Detective Club, to, to be yeah. where she is now. And it's kind of one of our, you know, long-term uh, projects is answering that question because it's it's writing, so it's not necessarily a simple question. So I'm not looking for the answer right now, but I'm just curious if you if you've thought about that and and what you might have to say as to, you know, why Christie was able to bridge that gap specifically, you know, after the war and then in the 50s and 60s become even more popular than she was in the 30s and yeah. 40s, and then even in your till today. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I, I, I agree that she, she is the exception to every rule, really. Um, yeah, when you think she, she is surely by far the most successful female playwright of, of all time, quite apart from everything else, it's, it, her, her breadth of achievement is quite astonishing. And, and it, it's difficult to generalise from Christie because she is unique. Um, she is one of a kind. Um, in terms of the question as to why, I think that it's got a lot to do with the nature of her writing. Of course, I, I look at Christie 
particularly nowadays, uh, in terms of a craft. I, I look at it as, as one writer looking at, at another writer's approach and technique. And, and her gift really was for simplicity and straightforwardness. And that, 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 that is a much, I think in any walk of life really, uh, a much undervalued gift. Uh, yeah, as, as, as a great lyricist once said, it's, it, it, uh, it's easy to be complex. It's very difficult to write a simple lyric that, that everybody loves. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's a proposition that's, that's widely applicable. And with Christy, there's an element of universality. Why is it that people in Africa, people in Australia, people in Japan, people in China, people in South America, uh, people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different religions, no religion, uh, why is it that all these very different people can find something in Christy? And that is because of the uh, simplicity of approach that you, you're just dealing with essential human types in the stories not characterized in great depth uh, by and large, but, but people that we can all recognize, uh, types of behavior. And this, of course, is the genius of the murder at the vicarage and of Miss Marple, that although she's only ever lived in a small English village, uh, it's, of course, it's only later she jets off to the West Indies and all, all that, but uh, 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 she's grown up in this village, she's had a very narrow existence, but she's seen and understood, crucially, human nature, the way that people behave. And so the, the way that the butcher's boy or the fishmonger uh, or the person in the post office or the grocer, uh, the way that they have behaved in certain situations, she draws parallels and, and it enables her to solve the murder mystery. And in the same way, if, if you're living in Portugal or Brazil or uh, Australia or Tokyo or wherever it may be, you can recognize certain types of behavior. And I, I think that this is, uh, th this is where we get to understand the, the breadth of appeal of these stories. It's because she, she doesn't uh, obscure the fundamentals in the way that most writers uh, we're all tempted to do. She she sticks to the basics and she does it very uh, uh, very cleverly and very persistently. And over a long period of time, you know that longevity does does matter. Uh, it does make a difference. The fact that she kept going for so long, I I think she would still have been a a huge figure had she finished when Sayers and Barker did at the end of the 1930s. But she wouldn't have been as huge, I, I suspect. Uh, now there's so much material uh, that um, uh, you, you can, as you well know, uh, spend a long time reading those books and then, then you can start all over again if, if you want to. Uh, there's a lot to go at. And so that too is a contributory factor in, in my opinion. Yeah. I, the way someone put it, I forget who it was, it might have been Sophie Hanna actually, is that, you know, Christie wrote so much that if you do read the oeuvre overall, right? You, you, you start at the beginning and, and you go all the way through all 66 books. It takes so long to read them, but that by the time you've gotten to the end, it'll have been long enough since you've read the first one that you can just go back and start over. So it's just an yeah. endless cycle of, of yeah. Christie, should you, should you wish. And I, I think that is meaningful. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you about, because off of that, that comment actually that you made about her, you know, um, really enduring after World War II, I was thinking about something that I think we've we've been noticing in the podcast and uh, in the books from the 50s and now going into the 60s, which is that the puzzle mystery aspect of the books changes. The books aren't quite as tightly constructed as puzzle mysteries yeah. in the 50s and then in the 60s. And yeah. it's funny because I'm going to disagree with something that we've been saying now a bit consistently for, for a while, which is that that represents a loosening and in in some ways almost a you know a weakness of christie's that you know she had this sort of tightness of construction at the beginning of her career and perhaps that reflects a decline of some sort or the fact that she'd been doing it a lot but i i was thinking about it and i think that perhaps it's also the fact that 
people were, that's not what people wanted as much then. It wasn't so much about the crosswordy puzzle aspect of books, which is why you get books like Ordeal by Innocence, where there's all of this psychological complexity, true yeah. psychological complexity layered over the book, unlike an appointment with death, where it seems a little bit more like the window dressing of psychological yeah. complexity. It's true psychological complexity in Ordeal by Innocence, or we just have, we have pale horse on the brain, because since we just finished that one, mm. you have horror. I mean, actual <clears throat> horror that's, that's layered on it, so that she's doing more and, and almost in a way perhaps bridging the gap from that kind of golden age to, you know, more of a P.D. James, Patricia Highsmith. I mean, writers who are solving puzzles, maybe, <laughs> to a certain extent. P.D. James, certainly. Patricia Highsmith, not so much. Um, but doing a lot more that she's actually, it's an evolution, perhaps, as yes. opposed to decline. Do you think that's a fair statement? I, I, I do. And, and I, I think that's quite an acute observation, actually, because although, of course, in the later books, we, we do see decline, yes. I think that some of the books, um, a, a book I, I really enjoy, Emerge, Emerge as a Mouse, for example, I, I think some of those do show how she adapts to the times to some extent. Now, in a book like Third Girl, she's trying to adapt to the times. It doesn't really work. Uh, in my opinion. Um, but in a merger's announced that I, I think the point is made that, you know, that we've now had the Second World War and nobody knows who anybody is. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that, that's relevant to the story in, in more than one way. Uh, and, and yet it's, it's embracing uh, one aspect of the post-war uncertainty uh, that with other writers, uh, I Smith being an obvious example, uh, was addressed in a in a different kind of way. But Christie addresses it within the context of of what she's interested in writing about. Uh, you know, she sticks to to what she knows she's good at the the puzzle mystery. But but she does adapt to the times. I think Emerges announced is quite a good example of of that process. And then then of course Endless Night, which which uh, does does something that that a previous critic had said was impossible, and, and use use a device that that appeared to be unrepeatable. But she she does it in a different way. Uh, there's a different voice in that book, and it, it's done, I think, very very cleverly indeed. And even a book like The Clocks, which which tends to be uh, uh, not highly regarded by a lot of Christie fans, I, I've I've always found that a pretty interesting. Uh, but partly because of all the discussion of the detective genre, uh, but also because of the idea of uh, it, the, the plot itself plays plays with the notions of the detective genre. And I think that's that that's actually I think quite cleverly done. I think that's uh, uh, whilst not comparable with her masterpieces, it's actually a, uh, an underestimated. Christian, I think the clocks. It's it's one of the early ones that I read, so I've got a soft spot for it. But uh, but I also think it has quite a bit of merit as well. well I'm excited to hear that because <laughs> coming up, and I was dreading it a little bit because I, <laughs> I had that in my head that it's not not so good. So I'm glad to hear it. As often is the case, even even some of the the not so good ones often have elements to recommend them. So well, that that's right. And you've mentioned the pale horse, and that that's. That's a novel I've, I've reread recently because there's, uh, uh, in the novel I'm writing at the moment, there's a sort of uh, hat tip, if you like, to The Pale Horse. Uh, and, and that, again, is a, is a book that I think is, uh, although, as you rightly say, more loosely constructed, uh, it's actually a book with some very interesting components that I've been thinking about a lot as I've been writing my own novel. I was thinking about it only yesterday, actually. It's, uh, 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 and and I think what she does in that book is is very very interesting. It's not a hundred percent successful, but it's still pretty successful. It's a, it's a good book. I would say I enjoy it. We were talking about in our episode. Um, I famously like Murder Is Easy more than Kemper does. Um, I know that a lot of our listeners really like Murder Is Easy. We have it ranked actually very low. Um, it has. Nice. It has a bonkers ending, so, you know, that's kind of where that goes to. But we were talking about the fact that the interesting thing about, like, for example, The Pale Horse and about her 
writing career is that if you think about it really, The Pale Horse is taking a lot of what she was writing about in Murder is Easy, which is this faux um, folk horror. Yeah. And she's taking that and years and years and years later, reusing some of that, but actually, and again, you think of later Christie as maybe not as successful um, from like a literary standpoint, but mm. In this case, in particular, she's taking something that she did decades earlier, and it works like significantly better in The Pale Horse than those same sort of tropes did in a much earlier book. And I think that one of the things that, you know, if you're talking about longevity, is that she um, looked, I think, at her own past and adapted yeah. to it, right? Yeah. That, that, I, 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 I very much agree with that. I also agree that murder is uh, uh, easy, is underestimated. That, that was one of the very, very first books I read. And I, I greatly admired it at the time. And I still think it's a good book. Uh, first of all, I like the, the initial premise, the initial setup. And secondly, I like the idea of having two least likely person uh, solutions. I think that's very, very well done. Uh, so, so I, I, I would rate that more highly than many people do. Um, I, that's a book I, I like, for sure. Very, very controversial. How <laughs> <laughs> we, we might have to revisit. I just, just keep, just keep on. Catherine's just chipping away at me. I know. It's like one of it's one of my goals is to keep convincing Kemper. <laughs> <laughs> It will slowly rise. The one thing I mentioned this in, in an earlier question, but I did want to ask you because I think this is fascinating. Um, the Poison Chocolates case, which yeah. is um, a wonderful sort of, I mean, Anthony Barkley kind of did that idea, right, of setting mm -hmm. a murder mystery in and among a detection club. Yeah. Right? Sort of setting. I mean, it's, yeah. for anyone who hasn't read it, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And then you actually wrote an alternate solution to The Poison yeah. Chocolates. I mean, how did that come about and and what was that process like? Well, that that was something I, I enjoyed hugely. Uh, that's a book I've always admired. Christy definitely admired it. Uh, and, uh, and as did Sayers, it, it was a hugely successful book. And this idea of the uh, uh, the supposedly omniscient detective getting it wrong and, and the idea of the convincing solution to the mystery being overturned and then it's overturned again and then it's overturned again and so on uh, very very interesting uh, on all sorts of levels uh, starting with entertainment uh, because it is a very uh, uh, witty story in my opinion and um, i was very keen that the british library should should reprint it as part of the crime classic series and they they agreed and then i uh, uh, suggested they might care to include Christiana's, uh, Christiana Brand's solution, uh, written in the late 70s, that wasn't widely available. It, it had been printed in the States, but not in Britain, uh, and, and then only in a, in a fairly limited way. Uh, and so they agreed to that, they secured the rights to reprint that. And then during a conversation, I, I, I may have said that I, I always fancied the idea of having a go, but they, they suggested I, I, I do that. And so they commissioned me to write a new ending. And um, I thought about it, reread the book yet again. And an idea came to me that I was very taken by, uh, that I felt was in keeping. And I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't had an idea that I felt was strong enough, because it, it, it would have been pointless. But I, I, I was actually, uh, bowled over by by this particular idea. I felt it worked. Uh, I wrote it very quickly. It only took a day or two. It was only 3,000, 4,000 words. But I very much enjoyed getting into the style of Barclay as a writer. I quite like doing that. Uh, uh, I've written Sherlock Holmes stories, for instance. And I once completed another writer's book after, after the writer died. Uh, so I, I enjoyed trying to get into the Barclay mindset and the Barclay style, but also come up with a solution that I thought there was a clue to it in Barclay's text. So I developed that and, um, and I, I, I was also very happy with the, the way that reviewers and readers reacted to it. 
so because you always worry about that uh, but um, but it, it seemed to go down very well and from an artistic point of view for me as an exercise uh, in writing it was very very satisfying thing to do to write a, a fresh take on something that uh, uh, that gives a new spin on a, a book I've I've always admired. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I should have explained just for anyone who hasn't read it, you know, The Poison Chocolates case is, it, it, it's a grouping of sort of amateur sleuths, or, and some of them aren't so amateur, but it's, you know, we have um, Barclays, uh, Roger Sheringham is one of them, you know, his detective, and then a bunch of other people who are all proposing solutions to this case. And it's, you know, one after another, they seem like, oh, okay, that's the answer. And then they're just knocked down. And then, you know, yeah. it, we, we go through and it's so, uh, you know, it's so entertainingly done and, and, um, and but ingeniously done also. Yeah. And um, I have to admit, I read, you know, the, the edition that I read w did not include what your alternate solutions. So I'm going to have to actually check out what yours is because it's so perfect, I think, too. It's like, why not include include another <laughs> one? <laughs> and so I think it's it's the it's a, the more the merrier sort of situation. So yeah. that seems like it's just a, a great book to add on to the perfect book to add yes. on to in that way. Yes. And I think it is. Um, anyone who is a, a Christie fan and and just a uh, a murder mystery fan in general would love that book. There's just the, I'm an, I'm obviously a huge evangelist for the the poison chocolates case as you can tell and the moving toy shop, um, but uh, I'm gonna have to check out your your alternate uh, ending. So um, that's great. I mean that just sounds like a dream for a mystery writer to. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a it was a lucky break and a and a great opportunity and and just just a. A really enjoyable thing to do. I, I, I love doing it. That's great. You know, we usually asked. Uh, we usually ask if you, um, you know, to anyone we interview, what your favorite Christie is. It sounds like it, it might be the murder at the vicarage, just due to all those memories. But it, it, maybe not. Do you do you have a particular title? Yeah, I, I think and then the non, which I think is the supreme golden age detective novel. I, again, that was one I read very young. And I, I probably by the age of 10, I probably read it three or four times. I, I loved it that much. Uh, it, it absolutely bowled me over. And it is, it, it is the ultimate classic who done it, I, I think it's. And, and it, it, yes, it, it, it's got this deeper resonance as well. The idea of how do we do justice when the legal system lets us down. That, that theme, as in Murder on the Orient Express, but it, 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 it's all perfectly done, I think. So uh, for me, that is number one. Can I ask you a question actually based on that? We have a tie at number one on our rankings and, and then there were none is in the tie. We currently have it at number two because I'm really pushy and the number one is Five Little Pigs, which is my personal beloved Christie book. <laughs> But we were talking about this at length um, in the last time we were sort of reevaluating the rankings. And we were discussing the idea that if you looked at like the things that are in our top 10, they're all doing something odd. So, and then there were none. It's actually not a particularly typical book for her. It's doing no. a bunch of things. It's doing a bunch of things that she does well, but it is um, singular. And Five Little Pigs, structurally, is very odd. It's like a very yeah. oddly structured book. And she doesn't really do it again elsewhere. And, you know, Murder on the Orange Express, Murder of Roger Ackroyd, all of those are particularly singular, stylistic, and structural books that we kind of, and the entirety, I think, of our top 10, the hollow we have in the top 10, um, you know, they're all doing something almost experimental because if you think of it yeah. and then for none i mean when people don't give her enough credit as being a like very inventive writer if you look at any of those books they're doing something that you know are just like singularly inventive oh yes absolutely Ab and absolutely and and i think that I, five little pigs uh is, is but when i first read it again i was very young and it, it didn't didn't really do a lot for me, but then I went back to it later, and, and it, it's now uh, I, I, I've matured in my my uh, views 
uh, in many ways. And uh, I, I see its merits much more clearly than I did originally. I think the ending, the, the, the idea of uh, 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 that there, there is, a, I don't want to say too much about it, I don't want to uh, give a spoiler, but, but there is an image uh, at the end which is very, very dark, uh, as dark as you get almost in, in uh, uh, class detective fiction. And, and I think that's very striking. It's one of the things I particularly take away from it. Also the idea of miscarriage of justice, the cold case, and so on. So, so yes, it's certainly a book that I, I admire. And I very much agree with your point about experimentation and innovation, originality. Um, the, these are things that Christie deserves a lot of credit for. Uh, and I think that uh, the ABC murders, uh, again, I would put very, very high. Um, I, I also rate Peril at End House very highly. Oh, you're you're uh, preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the choir on Peril at End House. We, we had to knock it, we knocked it out of our top 10 for... It's number 11. It's number yeah. 11. Right now. And it was very, very painful to knock it out. Of <laughs> I'm still not over it. I don't. I don't know if I'm really ever going to be okay with that. But. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no, yeah. I just um, no. But I mean, I think that you know, again, that goes back possibly to the question of um, in, endurance, right? Is that if you are actually somebody who can very cleverly um, experiment with form and are willing to do that. Um, I think you are more adaptable going forward, you know? Not, not that all of those um, golden age crime writers weren't actually, you know, pretty interesting in what they were doing. I think they often don't get enough credit for what they were doing, especially from like the quote unquote proper literary establishment, right? Yeah, sure, sure. And, and there were people like Barclay, Sayers, uh, and, and others who were who were experimenting as well, and some of the structural experiments have have greatly influenced you know, the Borgesian type of writers. Uh, Borges was a great fan of Golden Age detective fiction. I was very fascinated a few years ago. I visited uh, uh, Neruda's house in in Chile, and and. Um, uh, I, I kind of digress from the tour and uh, when we we're in his study and there's mention of his collection of thrillers. Oh, I'll have a look at those. And there's this row of, of uh, books by Detection Club members from the 1930s, which I thought was uh, fascinating. So there you are, you see Pablo Neruda saw the merits of these uh, writers. I love it. Pablo That's Neruda, T.S. Eliot, you know, it, yeah. it, it runs yeah. the gamut. Um, it's also really funny. We interviewed a while back now, a couple of years ago, John Curran, of course, since, since we use his, his books all the time. And he made the joke because it sounds like he, um, that, that he and you were on a similar trajectory in terms of five little pigs that I was also on. And I think it's one that, that many Christie readers, um, go on, which is that when you first read it, you actually don't like it all that much because of the repetition. And it's just, it's not one of her books that, that except if you're Catherine, but it's, it's one of those books that doesn't necessarily, the pages don't turn as breezily as they do in a normal Christie. So for that reason, until you revisit it, it might not be a favorite. And he joked that it's almost like there's a 12 step program for five little pigs specifically. <laughs> we, we all have to see the light. We're like, oh, when, when did it, you know, when did it change for you where you realized the brilliance of that book and you sort of yeah. submitted to five little pigs? <laughs> well, that's, that's right. And Cards on the Table is another one that I, I admire. And that, that informed, um, uh, the last novel I, I, I published and I was fascinated because it's not explicitly referenced and the the way it influences part of the story is very indirect but I was fascinated I, I saw an online review of, of, of my book and that the, the guy who did that online review picked up the cards on the table uh, 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 element to it which I thought was fascinating and that, that's exactly the sort of reaction that you hope for uh, when you put these little things in, uh, in a very indirect way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a book I, I really admire. We really like that, but we're talking, this goes along with the same thing that we've been talking about because Cards on the Table is a very polarizing book. People, yes. I really, we really, really like it. We have it ranked very highly, but like, there are a lot of people who 
immensely dislike that book. Mm. And it's funny because, I mean, Kemper and I don't know how to play bridge. We had to like look. No. Up, we had to look no, up. I, the rules I, I, I don't bridge. either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we like actually like spent like an annoying amount of time calling like each other, trying to be like, okay, so how do you play bridge? Because it's, I mean, it's critical actually to the solution. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. If you don't know what dummy is, you're right. gonna have yeah. like a little bit of a problem with that yeah. book. And it's also repetitive in some ways. Yeah. That that's that's true, and it's a rare example, I think, of Christie using a bit of specialised knowledge that everybody doesn't have. Uh, something that she didn't often do, and of course, most writers uh, uh, go in the other direction. Uh, she she is unusual in in being so accessible, but of course, that's part of of the reason why she has such a widespread appeal. Yeah, I think you could argue cards on the table. It also, you know, has that 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 element of um, where her doing something unusual. It's the audacity of four suspects in a room. That's it, you know, and that's not normally. Well, that's often it. there's a sprawling cast of of characters, yeah. all of whom yeah. could be suspects, and it's just four, you know. It, it, that's that's exactly right. And the idea of a collect, collecting murderers that that was the bit that that particularly appealed to me. That that. That's a, that's a great idea. And if you think about it, it's, it's a pretty original idea. And uh, uh, I think it's beautifully done. She doesn't uh, uh, make a huge amount of it, but of course it's integral to the story. Uh, and it's a good example of how she, uh, how she comes up with these uh, very, very appealing concepts uh, that uh, have rarely been done uh, previously. Uh, and even if they have been done, she gives them a fresh spin. Well, you know what's interesting, and I don't actually think I've ever pieced this together until talking to you, Martin, is that you mentioned as two of your favorites, and then there were none, and cards on the table. Both of them are books about collecting murderers. Yeah. And then there were none is also a book about somebody who has collected murderers. Mm. Mm. And I mean, that... Yeah, I can't, I can't really believe that I've ever placed those pieces together before, but that's definitely true of both of them. It's a very, very, very clever concept. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, it fascinates me. <laughs> um, well, we should, you know, you probably have two anthologies to edit and like half a mystery novel to write before dinner time. So we, we should probably let you go. But we, we always have one final question. I'm, I'm very curious what your answer will be. It's a very simple question. It requires a very simple answer. Poirot or Marple? Poirot. Interesting. I thought you were going to go with Marple. I'll be honest. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Marple. Uh, and I mentioned before that the uh, this concept of, of, of uh, uh, the woman who's had such a, a restricted life but understands human nature is brilliant absolutely brilliant but the uh the mysteries by and large in the best poros i think are uh at a very high level and that's true of a few murder at the vicarage body in the library murders announced but it is not as consistently true in my opinion with uh, with the marbles so that's that's why i give that answer that's that, that that's an excellent an excellent reason for a surprising answer. <laughs> <laughs> it is the writer's job to surprise the crime writer's job anyway. A, a, a fitting way to end. Um, this was just absolutely delightful. I mean, thank you so much, Martin, for sitting. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally wonderful conversation.